I appreciate you supporting me before the channel started, and I'd like to give you some good content now. Today is the first in a series that I'll present to you in which I will turn to a variety of practitioners who feed upon the myth of antiquity. These are Gnostics in the flesh. These, these folks have, they're possessed by ancient demons. And I've got one here with us today. Uh, so um, everybody, please meet Dr. John Price. <laughs> he is at the leading edge of the Jungian world, and he will determine the future of how this art develops. You can consider him a master. John, would you just regale us with some of your <laughs> background? Some of your I think you overstate, uh, you slightly overstate my uh, position, <laughs> although it's, uh, it's, it's appreciated, but I... I, I would lead by saying there are um, real masters that I look to and uh, they, their insights are held in books and in experiences. And um, I consider myself a, a student and a humble student and somebody who is um, consistently curious and ready to, to learn and be receptive and to learn. And I, I do think that any teacher really does need to be very clear about how uh, much of a student they really are. And as soon as they stop that, they become, they turn into, if, if you stop with like the, the richness and the curiosity of, of, uh, of a student, um, you just, you become kind of stale. And um, there's no, uh, the B Buddhists call it beginner's mind. The, the uh, Shunryu Suzuki wrote a story, wrote a book called Beginner's Mind. So I, I try to approach this content because um, we're dealing, as you said, with mysteries, and um, I certainly can't make any um, any concrete uh, belief out of what is beyond. So I, I think Jung is a really good intermediary who studied the psyche and the psychology of uh, what I would say on some level, and this is a pretty large statement, but studied the... <clears throat> the kind of the known, the, the ways in which we consciously relate to the unknown. And, and so he was really able to say, I don't need to make theological assertions. I can just talk about what's happening psychologically. So that's kind of my lane is to be in the world of psychology and looking at most of what comes up in the mysteries from the perspective of psychotherapeutic intervention and ways in which that psychology can help us understand um, how the perennial nature of the mysteries exists in pretty radical ways that we continue to um, to see throughout culture and throughout um, history. So uh, I think it's important, John, that people recognize that you've been talking about mystery um, and its operation, and you are yourself a practitioner. Um, I, the audience should know that you have you have been to places and seen things that many of us would find difficult to deal with. And you are at this nexus of human suffering and medicine. And uh -huh. uh, so when you talk about mysteries, I think people people who are listening to this should appreciate the fact that you're talking about the practical application of those yeah. ancient forces. Could you talk a little bit about I, um, I wanted you to tell the audience uh, who you're, um, education-wise, where you've been, and uh, tell us about this think tank, Esalen, and your involvement with them. So uh, I got two bachelor's degrees, one in interpersonal communication, um, in s speech communication. It was kind of a way of um, navigating the complexities of public spaces and <laughs> and speaking to people. Um, and I thought it was great, but primarily I was interested in just getting a degree because I was playing music at the time. That was really my my heart and my interest. And then given a series of wild events, I 
was put into a therapist's office or I chose, that sounds bad. I, 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 I sought out a therapist and I thought that it was pretty magical what was happening in that space. I'd, I'd primarily been pretty guarded or protected against going into those places, I think for good reason, because being self-reflective is you know, moving into discomfort. It's voluntarily moving into discomfort because what we learn consistently from all of our religious traditions is that one of the fundamental natures of human reality is that we suffer. And so the the inevitability of facing that suffering is just what you get for the cost of admission into this reality as a human. So I was in that space for myself and uh, Jung's very interested in what's called the wounded healer. And of course that is a thread that permeates the healing arts that, that those who've been hurt either, it's not so either or, but we could say the spectrum is those who've been hurt can tend to hurt other people taking out that hurt on others, or that can be transmuted into something that becomes kind of a, a healing endeavor mm -hmm. where we work to heal and to repair people with what's been separated or fragmented or hurt or amputated or cut off or whatever language you, you want to use. And you're so, dealing with people who um, have been victims of sexual trauma, for example, uh, real dark, um difficult places to go right i mean that's you you crawl into those spaces right well that's the 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 training when i did my my second bachelor's degree i was trained in uh, uh what's called trust-based relational intervention so it's working with children from trauma working in primarily adoption and foster care so as you can imagine in those communities there's a lot of uh darkness you know the hidden uh, I, don't, I don't mean evil of course there is is that but these are parts of development that are hidden and that are um, rejected and are disowned. And so when when any of us are so for that burden of not being connected and in a meaningful way um, with what psychoanalysts call a one good enough parent, a good enough source of nurturing, then we uh, we really struggle later on. So the course of my development involved childhood trauma, I, I got a master's in clinical psychology and I worked uh, a lot with adolescents and I was looking at addiction and certain spiritual pathways, including Buddhism as a, as a way of kind of healing addiction. And then I started my doctorate in Jungian psychology and that's when things got weirder, you know, like they, and I love that. It got really weird really quick. And cause I, I, I started studying religion and religions and philosophy and metaphysics and anthropology and just touching on all those, um, arenas, but primarily looking at it through the lens of, of healing and therefore hurt and how you, how we get hurt and how we can live out that hurt or look consciously at that hurt and try to uh, not repeat it in ways that are um, unconscious. So for those of us who are living in the apocalypse and about to enter the second half, what do you do? What do you do for us? You know, recently I saw that um, stress related mental illness is up um, and trauma, lots of trauma, lots of lots of forceful trauma out there. What do you do? Um, how, how do you intervene using your magic? That Esalen is a is a really wonderful institute, um, a learning institute, an experientially based learning institute that started uh, in the 60s, ideas kind of in the late 50s, I can't recall, but I, I actually, in my podcast, I interviewed Jeff Kripal, who's really involved in Esalen, and he's written a book on Esalen, and uh, I, I interviewed him maybe a year ago, as I was heading out there to do my first retreat on uh, fame, I was looking at the psychology of fame and shadow, and not necessarily fame from the perspective of the celebrity, just how all of us seek to be known or seen. I mean, that's typically where we feel the most wounded as if we've been seen and, and where we feel alone and isolated is a place that hurts. And so fame being seen or being um, renowned is kind of the antidote or viewed to be the antidote to this existential angst of aloneness. So, uh, and, and I wanted to see the way that our culture plays that that out those shadow patterns. So Esalen is is a real center point of counterculture movements, you know, where 
all of the all that can't be included in the popular discourse of the academy or of uh, more social spaces, you know, given that we, as you increase the amount of people in one situation, in one setting, um, it, it it waters down or sanitizes the ability for us to uh, not be ideologically minded. Because I think as we get larger in population, we we take these shortcuts in our identity and kind of borrow from others, and we don't do the heavy lifting. So I think real religious, um, early religious groups or communities were small groups of communities. So Esalen is a small group. I'm not saying they're religious. In fact, they would, Jeff would talk about something like they, um, he says, nobody captures the flag at Esalen, meaning that nobody really lands on a certain ideological approach, whether it be spiritually, religiously, or metaphysically. Although there is a pretty strong current of um, idealism or um against physicalism, which to your point, you know, I, I think, and I may be going way far afield here that um, we have, we have done a really good job as human beings of creating a lot of creature comforts. You know, one of the things we do is create tools and extensions for us to battle against uh, discomfort and achieve uh, elements of pleasure, you know, whenever we can. And so what happens is systematically, we get a little bit detached from um, from suffering, from our own suffering, because we spend so much time trying to get out of suffering. So places like Esalen, for example, are these meaningful centers that have allowed um, conversation and experience that really matters, that's kind of beneath what the larger culture would say is uh, is appropriate or necessary. And Esalen's been really thinking for a long time about these countercultural movements um, how to how to give a space for people to have the conversations that maybe aren't be having aren't aren't had in public spaces. So from from my experience there, it was leading a workshop last year on fame and shame, uh, fame and shadow, and then this coming uh, year in 2023 uh, with my friend and kind of co-conspirator Rodney Waters, who's a training union analyst, he'll finish in Zurich next year with his uh, uh, diploma in, in uh, analytic training. And he's a classically trained pianist, and I'm, I've got a background in music, and so we're doing a workshop on uh, music and ecstatic experience. And of course, drawing from a lot of these mysteries currents, you know, we're, we're looking at Pythagoras and um, Egyptian tonal, tonal traditions that chants um, the way that the, the I, and I'm speaking like a neophyte here, but um, the, the way these vibrations are, are on a cosmic and archetypal level manifested in our personal consciousness and how certain frequencies and tones can be used in ways to uh, generate alternate states of knowledge and experience. And so we're running this workshop on how to, how to create those experiences using music and tapping into these currents of antiquity. John, I have to, I have to conf interrupt you and confess, it's begin to, beginning to sound a little culty. Um, <laughs> Well, what do you mean by that, man? I can smell the the ancient <laughs> incense in the air. I'm wondering. I'm wondering. It's only because I'm burning some in here right now. That's the, that's the issue. Since we are since we are in the beginning of what's inevitably going to be the psychedelic renaissance. Yeah. Um, and now that the psychotropic drugs have made it into the you know possible treatments for different medical problems. Yeah. Um, medicine is it's inevitable that it's going to make it up to you, that it's going to make it up to the people who are on the front, who are dealing mm -hmm. with these victims of in incredible trauma. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, do you see a place? Do you see a place for integrating um, the kind of ancient practices that they were doing in antiquity with the drugs and the, the initiations and the um ceremony that reinforces specific images the things that give you the idea that you're born again do you think those ancient magic practices ancient cults do you think that they have any bearing on um the future the potential future tell us the future john what yeah I'm, well i think they already do i mean i think that in large part that's one of the reasons why i'm studying them is because 
for example, in psychotherapeutic traditions right now, it, it we're very interested in what can be measurable. You know, it's it's kind of shifting, but for a long time, behaviorism started um, coming into fashion, and so of course, what could be measured and observed was what mattered, and it, it's kind of a dire, um, a dominant way of seeing seeing the world. It's also an extension of how we operate. You know what what we can't taste, touch, feel, so see, and, and measure in some way, we reject. And this is what, I mean, William Blake was talking about this. Um, this has been a current that's existed for a long time. I draw from his well, because I think for a long time, I, I, I was drawing from his well. I was reading a lot from Blake. When he was taking on the empiricism of scientism, which is a limitation, it's a, a science is a, is a process. It's a very good process. It's an important process that we that we need to use to provide structure in how we interact with mystery, how we come to know what we know. Um, but what happens is it becomes something that reifies itself and, of course, believes it's exclusively the pathway to understanding and to gaining knowledge. And what these earlier traditions are really looking at is that knowledge is not limited by what can be determined scientifically. Knowledge can exist in what we would call in the imagination. And so we're, we're really playing with a tension between a dominant cultural norm of what can we, you know, the sensory systems, what we can measure, uh, what can be objectively true versus these other forces, these unseen forces that exist um, that we can relate with or relate with us. Uh, and we can at times uh, connect in a conscious way with these forces and 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 emerge in a transformed way. So trauma, you keep talking about trauma. Um, trauma, I think, first of all, trauma is inevitable. We're all traumatized. Um, there are moments in which we are overwhelmed by energies that we are not ready to contain. Okay, okay. Hang on with that thought right there, because now you're making me afraid. You're making me afraid because what you're saying is is. You know, you're still squarely in the cult realm, right? right? But you, now you're drawing on ancient forms of possession and things that mm -hmm. you're going to get some resistance. If I can be an oracle for a minute, you're going to get resistance to this. Am I not right? I mean, you're basically using sorcery on people to program them, to give well, the, them the problem with this is that Yeah, the problem with this is that we've allowed for the idea of sorcery to take on uh, a, 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 an exclusively negative connotation. And it, rather than talking about working with immeasurable forces and unseen um, aspects of our nature from intuition to you name it, um, what, 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 what this is saying essentially is because intuition or because these energies, we could say, aren't subjected to the kinds of modeling that we currently have we reject them and so and and there are earlier times in our existence that di that didn't subject the knowledge that they possess to these restrictive and limited ways of engaging with consciousness or with these kind of mysterious forces so i i think in some way it's really a cultural critique it's that our our culture hasn't really allowed for us to be in a both and kind of space where we can have room for um, ceremony and ritual and incense and placebo, whatever that may mean, and these uh, connection and relationship, you know, go to a hospital, there's no relationship. There are, and I don't mean, I, 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 maybe I'm speaking too, too feeling. I know hospitals are really trying, but if you're really trying to heal, like genuinely trying to heal, you're going to include certain images like nature. Mm. You're, you're going to allow for certain patterns like sleep, you're going to help promote really healthy eating and and allow for the body to heal because you know a body and you know how a body works. Can you have orgies? <laughs> well, now, I mean, see, that's when you say stuff like that, it's like, where the f did that come from? Like, what is that? You know, like, and uh, so I don't know. I don't know. I, the one thing I do want to note here that's so important is that I, I think sometimes what people can do is look to the past to try to replicate what was done. There's a reason that Christians call them temple prostitutes, right? The vocabulary is hilarious. But what do we do? 
John, is there some way of getting my audience naked in the wilderness um, in in an attempt to in an attempt to bring them back to uh, an understanding of reality and of history? Are you one of these guys who who they're talking now about the brain and the fact that it has a quantum aspect to it, which I don't know why that surprises anyone, but <laughs> okay. Um, how, how do you think it's worth, let me ask this question. Do you think it's worth perpetuating, bringing the mystery now? This, this whole series is about Lady Babylon and her uh -huh. cup, her cup of pornea. And that's why ultimately, you know, I brought us to the orgy. Um, can we do this, John? Can we bring this back? in order to heal all of this incredible trauma? Uh, it's, it's funny you say that. I mean, I, I, I think certainly there, we, 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 let me try to work through this. It, it's not necessarily going back as if it's linear. I, I think what we're saying is that, hey, we have these tendencies and patterns that have started to take us over that don't really serve us. And we want to live a more full existence. And, and something about these cult traditions, like like not, not current cult language, I mean like ancient mysteries cult language, because their cult is such a loaded term that to use it, people get their defenses up really quickly. So if we talk about what's happening in the mystery cults, these are small, I mean, my, my projection, right, are small groups of people that build their, their small religious spiritual uh, practices around some kind of an alternate state of consciousness or knowledge and they engage in certain practices like chanting or um, restricting food intake or going into a cave or taking drugs or doing these really intense practice pain was involved uh, it, it, what we know is that those those kinds of practices tend to destabilize the 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 narrative of identity and ego that's consistently um uh, that's the consistent lens we see through as humans and so if if we destabilize that then some other form of awareness tends to come on and and in our culture we don't really have a landing pad for that except in the counterculture back to eslin i mean there's there are folks who've been studying this stuff for a long long time but it's hidden and it's, it, it had to be hidden. Okay. I, I, I'm going to feel like we've got a couple threads that are hanging out there, but I want to be, I want to be mindful. Yeah. To no, no. That. So you're not promising, uh, you're not promising any cult initiations, but you are working a magic that is, uh, is a revival. It's part of a re renaissance of ancient um, human magic. Um, Bronze yeah. Age, Bronze Age, and and beyond. And so I, I heard a really good. So I can I can at minimum I heard a really. I interviewed somebody recently, and we're still working on when it's going to come out. His name is Edward Bever, and he's a um, he's. He, I have this book here. He, he wrote a book called Magic in the Modern World, and his other book that I interviewed him on is um, the Realities of Witchcraft, Witchcraft and Popular Magic in Early Modern Europe. Edward Bever. And when I asked him the question, um, what, what is magic or what is, uh, well, I just said that, what is magic? We were talking about witchcraft. And he just said, magic is a way of tuning your uh, nervous system. Mm -hmm. And I, I, while I think that's a reduction, right? Like I get it that I don't want to necessarily say, hey, let's reduce this to, um, to simply our physiology. I also understand that that given the nature of we're not a split, we're, we're not a, we see things in dual form and this is certainly a dual existence, but we're a unified experience. And so there's something about being in the body and recognizing the ways in which this body behaves and how we really do need to work with our nervous systems. And if, and I think that's magic. And I think that's certainly therapeutic to, to help somebody work with the magic of their own nervous systems 
And therefore, what the way we do that is through ritual, through ceremony, through conversation, through relationship, through modeling, through group practices, um, through paying attention to a, a master and kind of watching what they do. We always live this way. Part of what I think is developing is the recognition that we actually need to have these practices. We have a religious and spiritual nature as human beings, and we've not, I mean, religion is relegated to some some guy in the clouds with like a staff that is going to like bolt you with lightning like that's that's not what religions look at john why do you think it is that that image of the mother mm -hmm. is so powerful in your in your exposure to um mm -hmm. the the depths of the human mind in your practice and your therapy what do you think it is about that mother image? And is it possible that that is what the histories are, that the mysteries are drawing upon when you are initiated into the great mother or when you see the queen of the underworld rise in front of you? Is there something about that power, that maternal, would you call it an archetype? I don't know. Can you just address it? Because I, I would actually say, and is, this may be counterproductive in your endeavor, but I, I would say it's in language like the queen of the underworld has a certain time stamp on it. And that's one thing, like we are talking about, un, like I, I like the practice where we actually can't, use the name God. We can't say Yahweh. It's something beyond our comprehension. So when we're talking about these kinds of forces, we're we're talking about forces that are beyond our comprehension. And so we I think we need to be careful how we conceptualize. With that said, I, I like to think in terms of layers of this kind of consciousness, because on the one level, the mother is, uh, you know, so the ground of being, the, 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 the raw po potential of creation, um, the, 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 the formless through which we're formed, you know, and, and that's not, <laughs> we're using words to describe those kinds of um, images. Um, sometimes we can get lost and, and believe that the image is what um, that points towards. The image points us towards a reality. It is not the reality. So, you also have on, on that thread, you have from this kind of cosmic, raw potential, undefinable, formless, empty nature, all the way over to your personal experience with mothering. And so the, this, this theory is that we all have this uh, kind of material or maternal structure, this matrix through which we operate. And, and then our personal experiences of mothering color the experience of that archetype or that image and so okay john when does that mother figure when is she transformed into the harlot or into the whore when does the lady babylon who provides the cup of her communion which is seminal or which is um, a fluid substance brought by her pornea um when does that mother become the lover. At what point do we grow up, John, as boys being initiated into the great mother? At what point do we enter, which we grow into the state of sexual beings? Mm -hmm. I mean, is this a place that you can work with therapeutically? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, this is this is an important transition, and and in 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 number of ways for both young young boys and girls the mother is the not only first love but original uh, original um potential through which that child is formed and out of her the child is born you know like that's the kind of the nature of all this and so those threads are interwoven in our existence in ways that are really powerful so to speak of mother especially when you are in a culture that is devoid of mother the the my projections onto certain militant structures it's a very masculine male dominated uh, landscape and so uh, I, I think 
I think on some level, when you have that tendency in the outer world, that in this instance, that mothering part goes to the underworld and she's played out in um, unfortunate ways. And oftentimes he's never able to recognize what he didn't get from his mother or what he still yearns from his mother or what he still needs from his mother, because to stay tied to that is in some ways to stay a boy or a child. Um, so, so there are there are ways our culture hasn't really established the necessity for us to become the individual, not the individual, but the individuated person and um, identity that we were created to be on some so, level. So that brings on you. You mentioned boys and initiations. That brings on Rob. Rob, introduce yourself, and we're going to give you. Here's the game. If you do this right, you get an all expenses paid trip to Elysium. You get to be, experience the initiation and you get to see her rise. That's what that's what we're gonna do. Um, Rob, tell us about yourselves. Rob is the neophyte. Um, so introduce yourselves, un, undress, get uh, metaphorically and show us, who, show us who you are and this, this Magus that I've got with me today, Dr. John Price, um, he is going to help you. He is going to, to help you to discover, uh, yeah, your your rebirth. Um, please introduce yeah. yourself, Rob. He, he already has. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you, John. It's it's yeah, it's, 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 it's great. It's great to be in your company. Thank you. Uh, I uh, you are. It's all your fault, essentially. <laughs> it's all your fault while I'm here. I'm so why, sorry. Why, why I'm here today, and it, it's it's been a fantastic journey. It started with you, and um, it, then it went into an email, then it went into a few comments, and then it went into pretty much um, a research study that's lasted until today and mm -hmm. hasn't ceased until today. Until today, I'm... Still receiving books related to the topic that you all talk about, yeah. and um, that's my story essentially. Is I, I've been persistent enough to get in touch and try and tap into the the culture, what you're brewing, what you the the kind of um, the kind of collective consciousness, what you what you're gathering with your channel, with everything you're doing, and. That is one thing what is fantastic. But then the next thing is Eamon himself, which is a standout. It's a, it's a standout podcast, in my opinion, that that podcast with Eamon. There are brilliant podcasts, but that, that podcast with Eamon is, is profundity, isn't it? It's, it's beyond what you would normally expect to hear on a podcast. So... That I paid him. My... I paid him to say that. Don't don't take that. No, no. I paid him to say that. I, it Rob, completely tell us, grabbed my attention. Tell us what the. Tell us it... what the. Tell us what the Queen's Privy Council, and I'm talking about your, one of your departed queens of your great island. Tell tell us you've been listening to the, to the bits on the Nazis and the the Reformation. Yeah. And we all we all know that this is an element that we're having to deal with now, and um, yeah. so. You know, it, it may be a, a trauma that John is able to um, help unwind. And ultimately, I'm interested in, could we put evangelicals into this initiation in order to bring them to a point of rebirth? Um, can, can I, I, I want to jump. Sorry to jump in on it. I really I want to say something as we go into this, because it's important. If we're talking about mothering, we need to understand the, the, the kind of energy, energetic directions of where the wound happens. Because if we all have a fundamental need that's essentially empty, right? I just have this vessel, this this riverbed that needs to be filled, and it needs to be filled by mothering. But I'm going to experience mothering in pr primarily on a spectrum of one of two directions: either too much or not enough. And and that's therein lies kind of the the rub, which is the ways in which we get these dynamics that are played out in our individual lives and our collective lives. So I I, I just felt remiss if we didn't kind of position what where the wound occurs, because I can be wounded by too much nurturing if I don't have any structure. If I'm always met, 
I always love this is back to the story of the Buddha, right? Like in the Buddha, the father was saying, hey, I'm going to keep you here. Uh, uh, sex, drugs and rock and roll are going to keep you um, in love and, you know, present. And he says, I got to leave. That was too much of a good thing, right? Too much good food, too much sex, too much pleasure, too much, not enough, same kind of dynamic. We're going to get hurt. And the that that thread, that initial kind of essence will play itself out unconsciously over time. So I sorry to jump in, but I wanted to at least plant that seed. And Rob, dude, great, great to see you on uh, on this random Sunday. Thanks, John. No, no problem. But again, that that is what what you've said there is uh, it's it's quite profound, isn't it? What what I've um, gathered from what you're saying is I, I often think about the womb. You know, and the 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 weight of car- being carried in that womb for nine months to to any any soul, any any person who's within that womb. That that's the place where you first start receiving your your signals from your environment, and you start mm-hmm. forming in a in a certain way. I was I was thinking about this not ju- just just yesterday as I was thinking <laughs> about when when I, when when I, when it when the sperm meets the egg and you, you, you what you what you start is a war essentially how it's described in the in a midwife's magazine i read about preeclampsia what you start is, is a war essentially where genes are knocking out other genes and the the fight is from both sides both sides are fighting each other to win the what whatever that gene or that cell is going to be and the important part of it is there has to be a balance. There has to be that ideal balance between the two genes hitting against each other because if you don't have that balance, you, you develop preeclampsia where one gene is becoming dominant over the other. Therefore, it, it's a worrying thing and sometimes you have, to, you have to be taken in early and perhaps give birth early. But that's... The, the very start, the, the, the inception and the conception of the human, what's going to develop into what we're discussing and what, 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 dis, what, what, what becomes a Nazi, essentially. Uh, that, 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 that's the mothering aspect and that womb aspect is something we all seem to have a craving to go back to. And maybe, maybe there's something in that with the caves, with the with with the need to go back into a womb environment to find ourselves again. It's it's so interesting you use the the womb as the as that image, you know, because because we I'd like to offer up another the additional piece to this, which is this kind of psychoanalytically based idea that we are these beings that will repeat or seek out what's happened in our history. We are a collection of our histories that continue to play themselves out. The other side to this is something very interesting, which is emerging with the great mother, that there's a an urge inside of us to connect with, not so much moving backwards into the womb, but ultimately surrendering to our own death and recognizing that this human existence will merge with the great mother to use that language system once again and that we have we are <laughs> teetering between the balance of that initial womb experience when we are born into form you know and in, in at conception to when we are dissolving this physical form and merging with the great mother at the end of our lives and so there's and 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 that's the 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 pool that we're operating in all the, the entire time interestingly enough mm-hmm. so there's something so deep about this you know totalizing uh, matrix that we're in so if rob is a if rob is an ancient greek um we'll say he's a thracian we're making thracian and he brings up the womb and you talk about death, and I read a Byzantine manuscript on the, the uterus and why it has the names that it does. Nobody ever reads the medical stuff. I don't know why. 
but um, that it's compared to a tomb, <laughs> and it's considered to be that 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 dark emptiness, that dark emptiness from which the great mother brings life. And so right right away, it's cyclical. What would you say then to Rob? If Rob is sitting there and he's your Thracian and you're the priest and you've got him in California stripped naked because I, I've, you know, I know you can do that. I know you have the power to do that. And he's, you know, in our conceptual world, he is an initiate. So he's gone through the beginnings of the fasting and the, the proper health. You were talking about health care before, you know, because mm -hmm. what you what you're doing is you're reconstructing that temple of Asclepius. Yeah. So he's been there for a few days incubating and you've got him now and you're talking to him while he's under the influence and he comes up with the womb. Well, what do you where do you go from there? Make it visible for us so we can see how the hypnosis works on on rob would you would you mind doing that i it totally although I, I gotta say it's so situational and uh because victor frankel said something that i like very much in his uh book man's search for meaning that if you do the same thing with any one patient if you do the same thing with two patients you've messed up with one of them and so there are there are real I'm very mindful about any systematized, manualized approaches for healing, which is radically the individual, right? Then, excuse me. So with that said, that I can't really, um, I can't really acknowledge the intervention to use a blunt term um, because I don't know necessarily what the diagnosis is now. So let me, again, with that said, I'm not giving medical advice here, but uh, the first thought that I had, if Rob, if you're in the middle of that, then my job is to get the fuck out of the way. <laughs> you know, like there, there are, there are times when I, I think like when I used to play in bands, you know, I used to love the, I still love the musicians who myself included, who tastefully know when to play and when not to play. I mean, you surround yourself by people who are um, incredibly trained musicians that know how to play single you know maybe a couple of notes in a very tasteful way and it supports the song and so as a as a clinician or as this priestly class that you're talking about Amon, i think a lot of times it's knowing when to back up and when to let because the, <laughs> the great mother has wisdom that i don't my job is to create an opportunity for you to connect with the great mother so and, you're you're causing your patient or your person that your initiate, you're causing them to be possessed, just like they were. Rob, would you say it's fair that that John is trying to possess you with that power that he's in focusing, you know, bring it is not watch, watch. Now he's going to say some things to you that are going to enhance that, right? And it brings it out. How do you feel as the initiate going through this? Assuming you know, uh, you know, you're under the influence of some very strong formulae that I'm translating and that are beautifully intricate. We have no idea what the, nobody's going to be able to figure out that chemistry. Mm -hmm. But say I've put you, Rob, onto the venom. You're on the venom now and you're, you're working with John. Where, where's your mind? Confident, confident in John. He's, ju he's just won a certain amount of rapport with me through the integrity that he's approached that with. So now I'm, I'm, I'm with John, and the next thing he might say could be relevant, and I might take it on board a little bit easier than I would have done mm -hmm. if he'd said something different, if you know what I mean. If he hadn't come over so genuine, I might not have taken that on board so easy. Does that I mean, make any sense? It, yeah, did he, just figure, did he just figure out one of your tricks, John? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, it's not, so, it, it, and we're, <laughs> this is great, trick. <laughs> um, so, so the way we function, like these are just truths of truth, capital T. As I said it earlier, that there's a very early stage of development called trust versus mistrust. And if we haven't had that conflict resolved at a very early age, we will have to work on that conflict later. Um, so, so 
one of my jobs would be that if somebody comes in and they're just not trusting, I have to work on the level of trust. And I've got to get their animal to trust my animal. And that doesn't happen because I say nice things or I know a lot of stuff. It happens on a deep, unconscious, animalistic, primitive nature. And if I have somebody in my... Now, now, Amin, this is one of the things. I mean, you and I have talked about this before. Like, I don't operate under what, uh, let's say, cognitive behavioral therapy has an approach called flooding. Flooding is what you do. If somebody's got a spider phobia, for example. They come in my office and I just have 10 spiders. I just release in the room and I lock the door. And they've just got to deal with it. Uh, and that can be effective. It can also traumatize um, so we have to be very careful, right? So I, I'm trying to assess what level of intervention is, a, is, is valuable. And the first level of intervention in my modern approach by far is trust. If, if I don't have somebody that, and here's a fundamental like spiritual word I hear a lot of times, surrender. There's no way you can surrender to this process uh, if you don't have somebody walking with you. Um, or it's difficult, I can say. It's very it would be it would be incredibly difficult for somebody to surrender to the process without having somebody to look toward and say, Am I safe? Because egos inherently seek orientation and they can go a lot of places if they at least know, okay, like I don't feel good. This is not okay. My body, mind, heart, and spirit is telling me I'm gonna die and that I should trust nobody right now. But I've I've surrendered to this and I can at least trust this person, then I go through it. Like when you work with trauma, when you work with grief, think about that. Like if you're grieving somebody, one of the things you most want is that person back. Right? Whether it's a relationship, whether it's a death, whether it's a, a breakup or a death, you want that person back. And your your whole existence is going to be trying to create that opportunity for them to be back. And you have to trust that what you're actually doing is saying goodbye. And when you've loved and connected really deeply with somebody and you have to say goodbye to them on this plane of existence, when you're even struggling with your own existence in this plane of existence, that is a scary thing to say the least. So to trust is important in that space. Rob, so I, Rob, I mean, Rob, I, yeah, go let, on. Sorry. Let, me, let me interrupt. I'm sorry, John. Rob, wh where does that sit with you? What John just said? Yeah, it's 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 right. You, you you've got to develop that trust instinctively first. It's got it's got to be the first thing. I mean, if we're talking from a initi initiation perspective, then I've really got to trust the person who's initiating me. You, you're not going to get that far without without that trust. You, you you've got to develop that trust, and maybe I mean. You, to a certain extent, the doctor aspect plays a part because you, you, you've got a certain, um, you value a doctor more than you would do a plumber. Mm. You know, if you've got a plumber initiating you, then you, you wouldn't be so easy. You you wouldn't take the information on. But if, you, if you've got a doctor, John Price, talking to you, then that, that makes a difference. It's, like, it, it's, a, it's a certain level of up. It's not authority, but it's, you, you know, John's had to go through quite a lot of education to get that title. So you, you apply a certain, certain amount of it, weight, weight to your trust in him. Well, and not only that, he's, he's very good at what he does and his own field recognizing. We have to give him his kudos. Would you, would you let John, um, J John's talked about um, trauma, and I would say, if we found out, if we find out, Rob, that trauma can heal, would you let John um, starve you, strip you naked, and beat you? Probably not, to be honest. No. no. And, and quite frankly, Rob, nor yep. would I ever do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but if. But, but, but <laughs> here's the I, kicker, I, though, Amon, because here's where your language steps in in the way that I like to interpret some of this. I, I I do, for example, want to starve you of previous behavioral and thought patterns that used to serve you that we're learning very quickly are no longer serving you. Mm -hmm. 
I would like to remind you consistently when you go off of your path, you know, to maybe not to beat you to maybe I body check you in a symbolic way that says, Hey, you know, I noticed that you're going down this direction. Let's talk about that. What that means, you know, that to be naked, most definitely, but not literally, you know, like we, we talk a lot about the act of this, you know, of course, vulnerability, but less than vulnerability, uh, maybe not less than, I think, I think probably more than the, the word vulnerability in all our various trappings with that word and all the associations. But there's a certain um, desire for you as the patient, let's just use this dynamic for a moment, you the patient, to consistently work and be reminded to be authentic, really true about with the energies that are in you. Now, that's that's different. Like, what if the energies in you are rage? What if the energies in you are embarrassment and shame? What if the energies in you are, um, you think that I'm judging you in the moment and you feel agitated and like your, your fantasy is you want to tell me to fuck off. Well, what if you and I have established enough of a relationship for you to say, I really want to tell you to fuck off right now, John. And the way that I meet you is to say, well, why don't you, Rob? Where does that come from? Help me understand. Let's draw that out a little bit. Let's let's pull this part of you that's not able to be expressed because you can't do that in proper polite culture. But let's bring out that essence and so that we can look at it experientially as opposed to just keeping it in some intellectual prison, repressed. And it comes out when you are driving down the road and somebody cuts you off and you go into a fucking rage fit. And you're beating on your steering wheel because somebody just moved their car in front of you. And it's like, that's not about what that's about. That's about something else that you've been repressing or carrying. And so part of my vision of this work that first of all, first of all, has as a center point, love. Love and connection. And when you can love and try to engender and bring out more of the individual than they even know they're capable of because we love, because we need love, because we need connection, and because we've been hurt in the areas where we need connection. Typically, it's relational dynamics that heal the wound. Trust begins the f- first step. You're already, you're talking about other, I mean, expertise. No, America, America needs you, Dr. John Price. America <laughs> needs you, right? With, no, well, I'm, I mean, literally they do. I mean, you, you, you treat the sick. And um, in terrible, terrible, traumatic situations, um, what if America needs that, um, you know, that treatment that you're talking about going back to this mother? And um, I mean, can you start, can you start treating, you know, can you, if Rob hangs out, say Rob hangs out and uh, the wrong, the wrong, uh, club and ends up flying symbols that are mm-hmm. you know uh manifest his own sociopathy um can you treat can would you be treating nazis in the future will you be treating white nationalists will you be treating people who will stand against you as a as a therapeutician for lack of I mean, yes, I mean, uh, the, the answer is absolutely, uh, because hurt people hurt people. And, and now there is an element of somebody has to have had uh, an experience that changes their orientation, because when they're stuck in an ideology, they're, they're living a life caught by that thought pattern. That's not, that's not who they truly are. That's a surrogate. That's a so, so it reminds me of what I learned years ago, like something like 80% of, of gang members are fatherless. And when we seek out those very masculine identified um, hierarchical structures, they tend to provide us what we need um, on a deep level, but we find what we need because of what we didn't get. We find that's what we need because we didn't get it somewhere. And so if we didn't have healthy initiation into our own, and now this is important, it's not initiation into some kind of institution. It's initiation into your own inheritance as a human being, into your own existence, into your own truth, into your own authenticity. And unfortunately, systems 
and institutions are built around that dynamic that tend to imagine that they have ownership of that process when they don't. This is a spiritual path that is outside of any time and space and certainly any institution. And what we need are people getting initiated into their own existence, into their own reality. And what happens is we don't have healthy figures walking us along those rites of passage that help us recognize our own cosmic inheritance uh, in this in this plane of existence, whatever it is. Rob, so, Rob, do you yeah. hear do you hear Dr. Price talking directly to you? This is Lucifer. Do you hear Dr. Price talking directly to you? Uh, yeah, I uh, I hear the maxim on Apollo's temple, which is know thyself. Mm. The first maxim, yeah, is know thyself, and I, I think that's that's that's. It's the first maxim for a reason. What yeah. about your stain? Reason. What about your stain, Rob? What about My stain? Your stain? Do you have any particular stain that John is washing away in this process of rebirth? I, Not yet. No. <laughs> and let me let me let me. Uh, it, it, it's un, it, it's kind of unfair to expect John to gather. All the information he needs to assist me in what and what. I, I'd just like to go back to what you were saying about the whipping and um, being naked yeah. and going into that initiation. And I'd certainly be glad it was John. <laughs> I'd certainly be like, oh, I'm okay. It's John. I can trust John. Uh, but are we talking about like laurel or are we talking about olive branches? Is, is that the kind of initiation? <laughs> because the, these kind of things are what are reported from the ancient times, aren't they? I've been reading about them over the past couple of days, about incubations and mm -hmm. the kind of processes you'd go through. And these are some of the processes. And they have valid reasons for ethne, ethnogenic purposes. Mm -hmm. For some reason, that the, they've come up with these processes of health and beneficial means of going to an incubation and having a situation which you'd go to an incubation for. And these are the prescribed <laughs> antidote to your problem as being whipped naked <laughs> with an olive branch or a laurel branch, which is just part of the initiation. Then you, you'd go further into that. Uh, is that what you're referring to, Eamon, when, when, you, when you're saying... I'm stood there naked and I'm being whipped with a laurel with, with yeah. a branch or yeah I'm I'm talking about Villa the Mysteries brother I'm talking about yeah. the yeah I'm talking about somebody really getting it and um Dionysus being present I'm talking about the real cult that yeah. cult that reaches in and grabs the individual and um you would be comfortable this is interesting I find this fascinating Thank you both for your time. I find it fascinating. You you would let John strip you down and beat you at this point because you trust him, be, because you trust him, right? And I'm wondering if in that process, John, we can't do that now, right? We can't, John can't reach through the, we can't replicate the circumstances. But John right now could hit upon, John, um, it's a, can I just call it, it's a very important point, really, that you you would travel to the to, to the sanctuary. You you would travel there. So and you, and when you would go in, you would you I don't know what you'd you'd want somebody who you could you'd have a John's got a a trustworthy face. You could say. <laughs> John, straight, John, what is it? What is it about but, you but, that's so trustworthy? But, but you, but in, in 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 a certain, you're handing yourself over. You're handing yourself over, and you're withdrawing, and you're kind of putting yourself into John's hands, yeah. because you want to receive some therapy. That's that's the reason why you're going, and that's what you want to get out of it. And um, the way John's going about it right now is certainly, yeah. If we we wouldn't do it in this day and age. But they were the practices in that day and age. 
So though, those practices, you wouldn't really expect any different. We, really, we've learned a lot, but yeah. there's also a lot what we've lost within it. We don't know really what is inside or what why why they've come up with these ideas for initiation. Why the whipping with the branch? Why are you naked? Why you, you've got to go into wondering why them situations are there? Do they all serve a purpose? Each aspect of the initiation must serve a purpose. Otherwise, you'd you'd it'd be waste, and you'd and you'd you'd rid yourself of that waste uh, while you're going through the process of trying to help somebody with with a certain type of therapy. These days, we we've got a completely different way of going about it that's we, we didn't always have did we i mean you look at the early psychology tests what they would have what they've done on human beings and they were quite quite aggressive you know they, they have they have locked a girl in a room for years of her life only being fed food through a through a hole in the wall just to observe the lack of socialization just to observe that 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 was the whole the sole purpose of the experiment was to see what results they got from that experiment so you know we, we're not that far out of this i totally agree with that whip, whip, whipping whipping people and electrocuting people and we're not that far out of it and um, we're on the cusp really of discovering that there is something more and we're also discovering that that they knew more in the ancient times about aspects what we uh, what we are blind to in a certain respect. So you'd say, Rob, you know, you're a fan of uh, uh, John's John's fortunate position of being at this kind of renaissance where where absolutely. he can rediscover those ancient techniques, those that ancient physics um, we were talking about before you came the quantum. The, you know, they're saying now there's some sort of connection between um, quantum physics and the human brain. You know, of course, you know, it's just the human, the brain in general. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah you, you, could you say something about that in the world that we're living in, in this apocalypse that I called it before? You, you, you identify John as the healer. You can, you can feel that. You know that. Um, would you be comfortable with physicians going back to that knowledge and bringing that forward? I mean, you've, you've read everything in the world. Nobody can put anything past you, Rob. I know that. And if, if you're on a board of Masons, you're the leader. I know that for a fact. So um, for someone with such high standards, and somebody who knows, let's face it, you know, honestly, you've, you've learned a little hypnosis, you, you know, a little bit of that. Um, tell me about embracing John's Renaissance movement toward away from this, away uh, to, toward this healing, toward this healing that we could, we could send the fascists and the evangelicals um, uh, some sort of assistance rather than turning this American experience into a giant civil war. Yeah, certainly don't want the apocalypse or the giant civil war. It's, um, it's, it's not easy to, to view these things and hear these things and actually have a conversation about these things. It's not, it's not a pleasant situation. Mm -hmm. um, you do hear quite, quite a lot coming out of America now from, a, from this side of the pond and it's, um, it's troubling. It really is troubling, and I, I, I really haven't got the experience or knowledge base about evangelicals or even a, 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 any sort of right wing kind of entity uh, uh, because it's it's not something I'd study. It's not something I'd I, I choose to study. That you know you've only got so much study time to study. So. I'm going to dedicate that to something I, I enjoy studying rather than something I, I, I don't enjoy. But I have had to give me time to it quite, just of late. And um, it is worrying that there's an, a, 
a, a group of people that need treating by John's methods, that for, for need the treatment by John's methods says volumes to me, because John's methods aren't, I, I, I can't really say, as um, I watch John's podcasts and I, and I, and I really respect what John's work and he's the, I don't know John personally with what I'm trying to say. And I don't know all of John's qualifications, but what I do know of John is everything comes across as organic, organic and something that needs to be a part of other people's lives. I've said it's the, it's probably, it's probably the best kept secret amongst podcasts. And it's a damn shame that people don't watch more of it because it's got so much content. The, the, we were talking about the initiation from the past, but is it Sean, Sean Manu? Manu Menso. Menso, yeah. Menso, and uh, that guy's in the future. He's, well, he's, in the future. Yeah. He, yeah. He's, he's absolutely fantastic for, with thinking about an initiation and making your own set and setting. It was absolutely fun. It was a joy. It was a joy to watch and, and listen to how we'd done it because it resonated. Uh, it resonated so well with, you know, I've even thought the, 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 there is there is need for music therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, could, I could, you could have a client come to you with a certain set of problems and you could prescribe six or seven songs <laughs> to go, go home and listen to them and see what happens. You know, they're, they're, given the right circumstances, that could work. And Sean's doing that to an extreme. And I, I just thought it was fantastic. It was, it was something that is daring and goes beyond the boundaries that, that was. And that could be in, incorporated incorporated into the psychedelic experience for all the people who, who are really looking for the psychedelic experience. They're not looking for, they're looking for therapy in a therapeutic session, uh, setting. That's what I get from the psychedelic community out there. That's what they want. They want a therapeutic setting that they, they can get some assistance and experience a different perception it's a different perception essentially that you're looking for and once you get that different perception then it's yours to use and hold and yeah mold into whatever you want and you're not providing you're not... Pro providing that in a correct manner in the correct setting is paramount it's absolute paramount it's 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 a worry i i i have worries about this, the salesman and the marketing and, mm. and, and and the use of the use of it for make money because it's the complete opposite. I found the same with Buddhism. I'm afraid mm. uh, I, I wasn't christened as as a um, as a child. I wasn't christened, so I took to finding a religion when the internet loomed mm. and. I kind of said I liked Buddhism and I settled for Buddhism. I liked Taoism. Really, 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 really good read. Really made sense and resonated. But then I went into finding more about Buddhism and found as there was a lot. It was like a, a payment for a retreat. And, and from what I'd gathered from Buddhism, it was the polar opposite to what Buddha would Ascribe to he wouldn't he wouldn't be asking for money. It's it's not about this monetary policy. We of course money makes the world go round, but you know it's 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 not it's not so essential. <laughs> essential well, is yeah. Well, I, we, yeah, we play the telephone game with the, like supercharged yeah. content. You know, like it, it. You know, somebody has a direct experience, and then that gets watered down and played out and it becomes rigid forms of um, structure that we can apply as opposed to speaking back to relationship and fractals. And you know, part of Rob, let's use us as an example. 
part of the nature of why the relationship is so effective is because you, as the subject of the experience and me as the object of this kind of healing you know you hope right you hope that's a projection by the way i mean i'm a person you know but in the nature with authority and with presence and with experience and with the words and you can come in and you can share yourself and what will happen over time is you will introject the dynamic subject object gets introjected so eventually i hear the voice of my healers in my consciousness and eventually I become the voice of healing for my consciousness. And I told so, you he was trying to possess you, Rob. I warned you. <laughs> yep. You didn't listen. Very good. No, nope, that's it. No, nope, that's it. You're you're absolutely one of the members now. You're born again and you're you're fresh in that stream. You see how you see how it works. And that's that's what we're predicting for the future. We'll bring down this entire op satanic operation. The mm -hmm. fact that there is some real physics in this process and that john is not just a sham you know uh trying to make himself some money on the side that he is there in the trauma um you guys couldn't you guys couldn't have brought this together more beautifully i'm let me tell you both i'm so profoundly thankful for your time today you. and i i will end um i will end the show here so thank you for those of you who joined today um, this is the kind of content that I would like to bring forward for you. And I appreciate you and I appreciate your comments. I'm not selling you anything. I have nothing to offer you besides my dedication and the dedication of my guests to the muse. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Rob.